Hey, yo, what the f***? This is a pallet sh right here. The late night flight is paid for by the following. Hello. I have three questions for you. When you're talking NBA with your white co-workers, do you say that Dallas Mavericks point guard Luka Doncic is the best player in the NBA to position yourself as non-threatening in the office? And when black people think that you talk like a white person, do you reply, hey, hey, you would too if you graduated from an HBCU. Are you Rachel Dozer? If you do or are any one of these three, then you are suffering from the contribution of white privilege. Hi, my name is Nasua Nuru, and if you are looking to go from Wayne Newton to Wayne Brady, please give us a call at 1-800-HELL-NO-CAMS. That's 1-800-HELL-NO-CAMS. Give us a call now before you turn into TV. Everybody on a mountain, everybody marching for a young nigga like me to get tsunami on it. I'ma get it, I'ma win a baby. I'll be on my curry till I crash a bird. 40 on it, yeah, I'll make the nerdy. If it's at the appellation to the appellation, I'ma do whatever that they take to make a black a nation. Hold on. So, you down with RBG? I am. Um, I, I, I bang with Ruth Bader Ginsburg, who was uh, one of the last holdout um, liberal voices on the Supreme Court. Uh, she recently passed away. Um, but the real reason why I wanted to talk about this is because, you know, here we are with Ruth Bader Ginsburg passing away. And if you remember, Anthony Scalia passed away in in like February of 2016 while right. Obama was still president. Right. And when Obama made his nomination uh, for the replacement, the Republicans ex specifically made a point that he should not have that opportunity to pick because it was an election year and it was too close to the election. So that they should let the incoming president president have the Supreme Court pick. Right. Mm -hmm. It would have been either Hillary Clinton or Donald Trump. So they sent it just declined to vote and they let it expire. And then when Trump got inaugurated, he uh, nominated his pick. Yeah. Yeah. So but, here we are. Yeah, yeah, here we are. Less than two months away from the election. Okay. And we have the same exact scenario. Right. Absolutely. And Republicans are like, nope, we're going to put the next, <laughs> we're going to put it through. We don't care about what we said four years ago. And, and uh, the, the reason why I find that problematic is because, for one, it was President Ob Barack Obama's constitutional right to pick his Supreme Court nominee while he was, in fact, still president. But the Republicans said the Constitution because it was in their political interest to do so. And now it's again in their political interest to say what we said about the Constitution and using it to our advantage. And what happens is when you have a system that's based on completely based on partisan um, politics, there's no more democracy. Right. There you you go. Know what I'm saying? Yep. And that, yep. that's problematic for me. And I want people to understand what's happened because they're going to put a new Supreme Court justice. going to be Trump had three Supreme Court justice picks. You know what I'm saying? And they're all super conservative. And that's going to shape a lot of that's going to head into the future. So I want people to be aware of what's actually happened. I just want to run down some quick notables. She graduated first in her class from Columbia Law School. Uh, she was the first person on both Harvard and Columbia Law Review. She became the second female law professor at Rutgers, both for equal pay there at Rutgers uh, University. That's uh, New Brunswick, New Jersey, for those who don't know. Uh, became the first tenured female law professor at Columbia. She co-founded the Women's Rights Project at ACLU. Uh, if you want to know what ACLU, please Google that. I am not going to explain that for you. You should know that by now, Black Americans. <laughs> um, she argued six cases before the Supreme Court and won five. Now, this is what I want to talk about real fast. So she, you know, she's a, she's a feminist. She is the type of woman that is going to argue that females have been getting less pay as teachers, which is very true. So appreciate her for shedding light on that. But I want to show you how clever 
this woman is. Oh, by the way, first Jewish American female to be in the Supreme Court. Now, let's get to this case. The case is Weinberger versus Weisenfeld, all right? In this case, Stephen Weisenfeld and his wife, Paula uh, Polochek, they were married in 1970. He ran a consulting business, so, you know, he was an entrepreneur, basically. He had an irregular income. And Paula, she taught mathematics at a high school. She earned more money than him. She passed away from childbirth. He became the provider, uh, well, the sole provider of their newborn son. You know, to take care of the son. He had to cut hours, try to get child care. The point I'm making with all this is because, see, he wasn't able to get benefits that allow widows to get benefits in these type of uh, situations based Mm -hmm. on the Social Security Act of 1935. So Ginsburg made an argument in that um, that section of 402 from the Social Security Act that discriminated against Wisenfeld by not providing him with the same survivor's benefits as it would the widow. And then on top of that, just to show you that Ginsburg is a G. She also argued that Paula's contributions as far as her money for the Social Security was not even treated on an equal basis to a salaried mm-hmm. man. So she's, being, so she's also being discriminated against. Eight of the mm-hmm. nine justices, they voted in favor of Wisenstein and he wound up getting benefits. This mm-hmm. woman is a G, America. We are very, very grateful to have someone like this, you know, that graced our earth. I didn't really know anything about her like that, to be honest with you. I didn't even get to hear a lot of sound bites from her. But the fact that she got to be this cultural pop icon by being, to be honest, with a lot of people aren't really trying to be. No one, this, you know, no one, a lot of people, not a lot, you know, I'm not trying to be funny, like judges are corny, the lawyers are corny. The law system is pretty dope if you're into it. It's just that you, I don't know too many people that wanted to be a judge. So to even get to that highest platform and become a pop icon, I mean, we're talking about Taylor Swift, Beyonce, RBG. Mm-hmm. Are men in prison the new eligible bachelors? Oh yeah, we talking about you, Mr. Irons, and you too, Maya Moore. What up, though? Let me tell you, let me tell you, check me out. So let me give you a scenario, honey. If you can be in prison for 20 plus years for a crime you did not commit, however, however, when you get out, when you get out, you get to marry Maya Moore. Did you win that life? Only if I got a settlement on top of it. Okay, that's fine. So, Mr. Irons did just this. So, a wrongly accused person who was freed by Maya Moore, who had known each other since she was 18, right before she went to the University of UConn, at the University of UConn, (laughs) the University of Connecticut, otherwise known as UConn, and... They kept in touch and, you know, all of a sudden, here we are, a free man from her brain power and their, and their friendship beyond the court, beyond the jail cell, and now they're married. And I don't know whether I should falsely rob a bank or rob a bank, either way, I'm pretty sure I may have two or three baddies waiting for me outside, and I, I think I'm willing to do that. Right. That's crazy. Like, I just, I commend him so much. I mean, like, I'm just shout out to you for being wrongly accused and getting to marry a bad woman. Like, Maya Moore is so dope to the chick. Man, uh-huh. um, I don't know what to say about this, though, other than that. That's about it, probably. What about you? What you want to say about um, this? All right, so I, I'll be, I'm wondering if there's some sort of psychological explanation behind it, because if you remember, not, not in the not-so-distant past, uh, Centoya Brown, who was arrested for killing her pimp, uh, was serving a life sentence, and there was this whole campaign to free her. And in that process, the man who she... 
uh, you know, was being a pen pal with and who was helping with her case, when she came home, they eventually ended up falling in love and, and getting married. So I'm wondering if, you know, when someone's going through some sort of adversity, if it creates like a bonding uh, type of situation that causes them to fall in love and, and end up that way. Um, because, you know, it, it, I feel like, it, especially if she already knew him, you know, I, I, I just feel like you know, whatever connection they were able to build, that's a lot of intimacy. That's a lot of vulnerability. That's a lot of openness to share with the person. And I feel like it would be hard pressed for you not to fall in love. You know what I'm saying? No, no, I, I get all of that. I get all of that. The only thing I could say about all of that is now we all understand how Jada feel. Next question. Hey, yo, what the f***? This is a pally sh- right here. Can Black Utopia exist in a dystopian America. Wakanda forever. <laughs> um, <laughs> so this is in, in regards to, uh, there was 19 families who purchased 96 acres of land uh, as a safe haven uh, for Black Americans. And it was inspired by Wakanda's premise. If you remember from the movie Black Panther, Wakanda was kind of hidden, this hidden gem of, you know, technology, a utopia in its own way from the rest of civilization in order to protect themselves. And this is where this idea is coming from. So the question is, you know, can that exist in America? And, you know, when we have history of things like uh, Tulsa, Oklahoma, Rosewood, you know, the, the riots in, in the 1960s, will white America allow for black people to exist in their own safe haven without coming to try and interfere? I would say yes. It's just that from what it looks like, we can have cities. We just can't have a state yet. Mm. We have Atlanta, Houston, mm. D.C., that's legit. And, and maybe my, well, I wouldn't say we have Miami. I would say Cubans have Miami. But if, we, if you want to go, you know, people of color route, you want to do that type of route, then, you know, Miami has that feel to me. Miami doesn't, is it not necessarily Americana. It's more of, that's what Americana is, a part of this too. Like Americana has black culture, Cuban culture, Puerto Rican culture, uh, Dominican culture. Polish culture, Jewish culture. You know, we have so many different cultures. Like, a mel- you know, it's the melting pot. Anyway, point I'm making about this, this land that they have created, I'm thinking about the Netflix docuseries, Wild Wild Country. Now, not the whole, you know, we're going to poison people if you don't let us have our own community type thing, you know, because there's a lot of underlying, uh, you know, some underlying luggage that, that's not being pulled out of that suitcase really about that story. But, but the fact of the matter that they got to create their own community, that means a lot because I think in, the, in that article they were talking, also, they also were saying that, hey, you know, this town would be for everybody. If we had a town called Freedom, Georgia, this town is for everybody, but we want everyone to know that it's a black ran town. However, everyone's rent can, is, is, is able to come. Everyone is in, uh, this is exclusive for everybody. Right. right. You know, this is an exclusive town for everybody to come and have fun. I think New Orleans, in a way, has, a, even though it's very diverse, I think that like the soul of it, the, the jazz music, the, the cooking, that comes from a lot of, you know, Black American, Black Haitian uh, style as well. Right. You know, so I think that we, we've been able to, hey, I mean, look, Philadelphia, North, there's a lot of black and brown uh, communities, large black and brown communities that have been able to, you know, show that image of, to that city and get to be an image in that city. Yeah, but in these same cities, you know what I'm saying, the majority of the police force is white. There's still police brutality. Uh, Rashard Brooks got killed in Atlanta, not mm-hmm. too recently you know what i'm saying and right, it's right. Like, you know now, we want to exist in a, i'm talking about a true safe haven where it's like listen 
the mayor's black, the police is black, the citizens are black, and we are self-sufficient enough to mind our business. And we know that we can go into that town and our blackness is enough to, to make us feel safe without white interference. I think that starts with black names. How about that? Yeah, but where, where does it exist? No, I'm just saying that they can hire the type of police chief that they want to have. I mean, look, let's be honest. In a, in a town like North New Jersey, it makes no sense that about 20, maybe even 32 percent of the police force in North New Jersey are white Americans. Right. Let's just be honest. It's only about 6 percent of white Americans in North. So why don't you have 6% of police officers in York? It should, it should definitely be representative of the population. Exactly. So that's the issue with that. You know, it's more politics than actual lifestyle. I think the lifestyle is definitely, you know, I don't, I don't mean that you, well, it, you know, the lifestyle is very black American. Yeah. You know, it's, it's yeah, you have law enforcement that is supervising it. And, I, and to your point, that's a no-no. And, but to my point, I'm saying that's why uh, Mayor Bottoms, you know, she has to be the one to be like, nah, I need, like, you know, I want a black, you know, hey, I can have this in the image of the people that live here. She had a black police commissioner that actually ended up having to resign. She had a black uh, gay woman police mm-hmm. commissioner. If that's not the liberal trifecta of what a utopian society would want to have, and it still happened. But the only, the only caveat that I would say about this is that that you know these this ninety six acres that these people bought would yeah. be considered private land, so hopefully that grants them some sort of protection from you know uh, the police or whatever jurisdiction the police has uh, to come in and infringe upon upon them people's sovereignty. Yes, that's that's the, another important thing. This is an an awesome sign of sovereignty, something that I definitely think all people of color, hell, even if you're white, I think everybody in America can not only get behind, but they should be very supportive of, because this is what America is, is supposed to be here in this country. It's a place of sovereignty, so. Right. Hey, yo, man, what the f- Seems like the Steelers can't beat the Patriots or social justice. The f- because they let offensive lineman Alejandro Villanueva get to be a f- racist offensive line bigot. Okay, you know, I shouldn't say that. I don't know if he's a racist. <laughs> I don't know if he's a bigot. That's not nice. But he does things that suggest not only the learned behavior that, we're, that Black Americans are so mad at towards I don't want to say white people, but just, you know, the politics of America where they're, they're based upon a group of people and they have learned that behavior and they feel as though that this is the way of life no matter what, because it's, you know, it's been, you know, pushed in your system in that way. Right. Now, because, I, you know, I, I really want people to understand when we talk these, these black and white talks, it's not a shot to white people. I'm not here to make you take lashes. I, I don't dislike at all. I really don't. It is, it's the politics that go with, hey, as this person who has my own creativity, why do I have to follow your creativity to be deemed as important in the country that, hey, be honest, I'm born in, so I'm American, you know? So respect me. Anyway. That's another here and there. So, this guy, Bill and Wave, like four years ago, if y'all don't remember the story on uh, one of these uh, NFL games, the Pittsburgh Steelers decided to stay in the locker room. Not this fat. No. He goes out through the tunnel to put his hand over the heart. Just to, he, and, he said, and he talks about it in his post game. I wish I had the clip. He just said, hey, you know, I, I saw an open lane. I had to, I talked to I talked to the guys in the back. It just said, "Hey, if you really feel that you know that's that strong about it, just go ahead." Just because you have family members, and he was, and by the way, honey, he was born on a naval base in South Carolina, so he really feels you know obligated, right, to 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 put his hand over his heart and praise the same place where they hung people that you protect in the backfield. I guess you know whatever. 
Right. You know, now this situation with this, this decal with the person's name, I don't even know the brother's name. I, I feel bad. I'm not trying to be rude, but another, uh, another offensive lineman, Mike Darcy, <laughs> I believe he a black brother. If you want to look that up real fast, I need while I'm talking. That's fine. His name is Mike Pouncey. I really don't know if he a black American or not. He talk he talk a lot of like he a black American, but he also said I want to remove the decal. Now he is someone who has uh, he has a strong record of promoting uh, you know promoting a, 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 a collaboration with police. Like he supports police force. Hmm. He's giving money to a police organization. Now, now don't get me wrong, he also supports, you know, black lives and all that good stuff and brown lives and white lives and all that good stuff. You know, he wants to be a normal guy in this country like anybody else. However, he takes, he takes the decal off because he's saying that there's a lot of things about this, this case with this young man that is tricky. I don't know if I should be supportive of this. So here goes my flip to you, bro. There's people that feel like, hey, you know, this Brianna Taylor thing, you know, yeah, we could say her name, but, you know, she was a trap queen. Let's call it what it is. I mean, cops ain't just running up on your house for nothing. Or they want to talk about whatever happened to Mike Brown. He rest him wrestling a cop. They always want to sit, sit here and say this. There is a cause and an effect. There's a sequence of events. The, the people that's been doing, you know, that, that's been dead based on uh, the cop's hands isn't 100% innocent in this role. So I guess what I'm saying to you is, were the Pittsburgh Steelers, were they supposed to make this a, uh, like this type of social gathering where they had to put this person's name on the back of the decal? You know, because they don't even know the whole story about this, right? Right. So, uh, I mean, he appears, at least in, from what I can see, Mike Pounce uh, appears to be a, a black man. Um, and he's a light-skinned black man, so the, our delegation will be addressing this shortly. Thank you. Um, Jesus, but I should have definitely called you for that. Jesus. If the Steelers, you know, if the Steelers agreed as a team to honor uh, the death of this young man and, and represent then they should have uh, all stood in solidarity as a team. You right, know what I'm saying? Absolutely, because he, he, actually, he ended up apologizing, saying, you know, I feel bad that I let my team down and I embarrassed my coach and this, that, and the third. So it's like you making this stance and, and, and saying, you know, in protest, but it's outside of the team camaraderie that you all had to collectively agree to do. You know what I'm saying? So where's your loyalty in that respect? You know what I'm saying? Um, another thing that I want to say, like with stuff like this, right? So I, I recently was reading something that said that uh, tribalism actually causes less empathy, right? For, for, for people that's outside of your social group. So when you sub, sub, subscribe to tribalism, I mean, you think about it, this man, you know, the military, uh, sports, you know what I'm saying, race, all of these things are extremes of tribalism. When you are a, a fan of football and you pick a team and you're willing to fight and, you know, have conflict with another person who has an opposing team, that's the epitome of tribalism. So what happens is they, um, they did a study where it was like, they had a man fake like he hurt his ankle. And if he had on the jersey of the opposing team, people would literally like step over him and not want to help. That's, the, that's how it affects your empathy when you're so enthralled in your own group. So when you like, oh, you know, blue lives matter. Even in, in you know, this might be controversial, but even when you say black lives matter, if, if I'm yelling Black Lives Matter because of Black survival, if I see a white person in distress, I don't think that that should deter me from feeling empathy for that person. But apparently the way that psychology works, it does. So we need to really look in with ourselves and be like, yo, you know what I mean? At the end of the day, 
yes, I love black people. I support black people. I am, you know, for all things black people. But when it comes at the risk of me losing my humanity, you know what I'm saying? You, you have to be able to step aside from that and say, you know, listen, this is another person who wants the same things that I want and, you know, make your decisions based on that. And I, a lot of people can't do it. And then you end up having decisions like this being made that causes more controversy. Hey, yo, what the f***? This is a poly sh- right here. Has a woman ever used you to get back at her man? Hell yeah, I have. That sh- is whack too because you don't even know what's going on. You just... It just happens. And, you know, you being a man, you all horny and whatnot. You just let it happen. You don't know what the hell going on. But, <laughs> you know, you a pawn in the grandest scheme. But I was 19 years old when it happened to me. The first time it happened to me. Basically, mm. I am going to get my, I think you call it a Sora. Remember, get a Soras? Okay. When you're a security guard, you got to get that Sora license. Right. So it's a spot in Hillside, New Jersey that used to do the classes for the Soro program. So I meet this sister, African sister, a little, uh, I would call her voluptuous, but she had a Birkin bag one of them, Mm -hmm. voluptuous stuff. Okay. Oh, she had a Birkin, but come on, she had, you, like, it was definitely mother of Congo in here. And, you know, she gave me the look, I gave her the look, and after I fill out my application and they tell me how much I got to pay in order to, you know, take the class, we got the talking on the side. She said, yeah, you know, take my number. I'm like, okay, cool, no problem. She said, I do got a boyfriend, though. I said, okay, well, I, I guess I shouldn't take your number. She said, nah, keep that, keep that, you never know. I said, okay, no problem. So I went through the class, did all that. Um, it's about maybe about my third or fourth week working. And then all of a sudden, she just hits me out of nowhere. I'm like, yo, what's up? She said to me, yeah, my boyfriend cheated on me. I'm mad at him. I'm like, okay, I'm you know, sorry. I don't, I don't know what to say. I'm 19 years old. I don't know what to say about stuff like that. She's right. like, yo, what are you doing? What are you doing tomorrow? I'm, I'm, I'm going to be at work. And then when I get off work, I'm being be in the house. She said, yo, I want to come see you. Sure. Sure, come see me. And she definitely came to see me. Mm. And yeah, man, I mean, shoot. It was coming to America. Seriously. It was a new movie. Right. I made that movie. <laughs> and and it, the funny part about it is it did happen two times. And then, you know, of course I didn't talk to her no more. I wound up seeing her maybe like I wanna say six months later. And I saw her at the gym. I saw her at Planet Fitness. And I was like, oh, what's up? How are you? And she was like, I'm good. And I was like, what you up to? I was like, yo, we should get back up, you know? Like, I had a nice little fun time with you, you know, seven no months ago. So she's just laughing. She was like, yo, you know, um, I told you I had a boyfriend. So I'm like, yo, you went back to the dude? So she mm. just looked at me and was like, well, yeah. Wow. And I was like, oh, why? Right. Well, let me, you have a good day. You know what I'm saying? Get back on that treadmill, baby, you know? But, <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, that's just one of my stories where, you know, a woman have used me, you know, to get back at their man. And I guess I don't, I don't really understand that type of logic anymore. I think it's, I guess it's, uh, it seems cool when you're young, like you're so mad at your woman that she cheated on you or she mad at you for cheating on her. So y'all go do it to somebody else that you had some type of affection for, but you go back to the person. I, I don't really necessarily understand that, right. especially if you're the person who got cheated on and you may know who this person is mm-hmm. like that, that, that never books well for me because now I feel like I have been compared and contrasted to in ways that I may not even am comfortable with. Now. Right. Right. Like who is this <laughs> that just gets to hit it while you want to sit here and lie to me for the next 10 years of my life telling me that you only love me and it's only <laughs> me and it will always <laughs> be me. Like I'm right. just, Woman, you just lied to me. That's a that's that's a bold faced lie. Hey, yo, what the f? This is a poly sh- right here. Why can't a Chicago brother take his horse down an old town road and ride till he can't no more? Because that that horse is gonna die. 
That's why. <laughs> the horse is gonna f- die. What is wrong with this man? First of all, first of all, let's just let's just break this down for a second. Let's just break this down. All right. His name is Adam Hollingsworth. All right. He is known in Chicago as the Dreadhead Cowboy. All right. Now, I'm going to assume that he has money because who just busts out a horse out of the garage and say, let's go take a stroll. Who does that? Hmm. Anybody know? I don't know. Anyway, so he is protesting for Kids Life Matter. And he is having himself a joyride via horsepower, one horsepower, but probably very strong horsepower because it's an actual horse, on, get this, a highway. Now, let me tell you something. I'm not an animal expert. I'm not Jack Hanna. I don't know too much about animals, but I do know that human drivers are not smart. The horse has no other choice but to walk on this highway, which is super problematic. You're f***ing up traffic like that, because as soon as this horse starts galloping, it's over. Let's just keep it real. The horse starts galloping, it's over. The horse is going to jump over one of your cars. Whether it win or lose, it's going to just jump over the Chevy, crack that Chevy wide open, and then police is going to have to shoot the horse down, and then he won't be singing Old Town Road anytime soon. <laughs> so, I'm so mad at this man. Like, yo, why he why he has to deal? Like, oh, it's it's not a park that he can do a protest at. And I feel bad because now I'm about to say I sound hella white now talking about something. Yeah. He, can, he can't do this. Why he can't do this on a park? But seriously though, like a highway though. Like, I mean, when you do a highway protest, and I don't mean to be like you know the black American that knows about protests and just give you a how-to book, but I'm just, I'm going to assume when you do a highway protest, you get a bunch of people to block the highway. Mm-hmm. Not one horse. Last time I checked, even though I'm in New Jersey, when deer hop out on highways, we still hit that <laughs> Boom. <laughs> <laughs> but, yo, know, this dude is, yo, know, I, I really want to interview this man, but I, but if he do start talking about kids like matter, I, this is going to sound weird, but I may hang up on him. Though. Like, I don't even want to hear that. Like, yo, you really got to use a highway to so, do kids like matter? Like, like, you, mentioned, like you mentioned, like, like that's one of the more common uh, forms of protest is blocking traffic. You know what I'm saying? And, and essentially what he, he successfully did was slow down traffic uh in order to make his statement right Mm -hmm. so with that being said i know you were having issues with the dmv yeah what happened where it does a horse require a registration and insurance because (laughs) this sounded like a routine Mm -hmm. traffic stop like where they pulled him over on the highway with his horse they arrested him and then they took they impounded his horse and now the horse is in animal control. <laughs> so I'm like, you know, I, I, absolutely, that man, that man has a right. <laughs> he has a right to, to make his protest and make his stance. And, and he's, he has a constitutional right to do that. So I don't know what law he broke by doing that, by riding a horse on the highway. Um, blocking traffic is not a car; it's a horse. Yeah, but horses horses was the main means of transportation before cars were invented. Yeah, in the eighteen hundreds. Okay, it's twenty twenty. Listen, two thousand years later. But what I'm saying to you is that if he's if he's protesting, if he's making a stance, he has every legal right to do so. You know what I'm saying? So that's what I'd be interested because every article that I'm reading is not saying what law he broke. That's true. That that now that is true. I will admit that. Very true on that. So shout out to Lil Nas X, man. No, no shout out to Lil Nas X. <laughs> I hate his music. He is, he is terrible. He's an abomination. He is an abomination. To rap music, 
<laughs> an abomination. I hate I hate rap artists that think they slick and want to go to another genre and then okay they blow up off the other genre, but then they try to seamless seamlessly seamlessly ease their way back into rap. And then they, you see how suck they actually are. Hey, yo, y'all still talking about the music business? Hey, yo, Hanif, we already told Nuru he should write for Ja Rule, Prodigy, you know, one of them small ass rappers. Well, Lil Nas X got a million, uh, he can get a million downloads off the uh, off Old Town Road. And I'm like, okay, cool. But he didn't, I don't, well, you said he got it before the record labels hollered at him. I don't know if he did, but. Let's say he did. This is where the record labels come into play because realistically, you're not going to bump into a million people. Like, like, yo, based on what you just said last week about the whole, the music industry is not even set up for today's industry. Like, it, like it's really easy for you as an independent person to make your money. It's really easy for you as an independent person to make your money. But here's where it gets fucked up at. Realistically, honey, you don't know a million people. So you can have the best song out, but you need other people to boost up your song. Mm -hmm. If you knew Snoop Dogg and Snoop Dogg told everybody, yo, check out my man Hanif's new track. This shit is official. Now you on. You feel me? Right. That's Snoop Dogg. Now, just because you got the hottest song in America, but no one knows you, that doesn't grant you a million people to listen to. Mm. Think about that. Th that's the point that I'm trying to help you out with as far as, well, not help you, but make my point where it's, it's basically the, where the record labels be going right as far as, I right, well, we give you the platform at the end of the day. You know, like we give you this. Now, I don't know why these select, like our stars, like your Jay Z's, your Kanye's, I don't know what their situation is. I'm, I, I'm just going to assume that it's business people not wanting to spend their money. They want to spend someone else's money. That, that's my only conclusion to that, always for that. But because, like, my, realistically, if, if I found a way to make $6 million, let's say I was on a contract, I made $6 million in two albums. Like, I had a two album deal, I could make $6 million. Whatever. After the, after them two albums, and if I made, let's say out of that six million, I really kept like you know, let's say two point five mil. I might dish, dish my contract and say, "Yo, I'm gonna do it on my own." Right. But that's me. You you never know how much more money they talking after those two albums. Like how much money you really think? No, like let's keep it real. How much money you think that champ gave Kanye West after the second mm -hmm. album? Like yo. Like after late registration, it was like, yo, yo. Nah, they didn't yo. that much. No, I'm talking no, I'm talking about see the contracts, you guys. They got they get contracts the way like basketball players do, like where it's like four years, this much million. They have like album deals. Like you get for three albums, they do this. Like the good ones, not not the 365 deals that they give out. Right. We're talking about a Taylor Swift type of artist. Right. You're going to have a three album, blase blah million dollar deal. I don't want to like put the, the numbers out there because I don't know how high or low big they actually are sometimes, depending on the artist. That's what they have. So what I'm saying is they obviously giving them some crazy type of money after that first ride they have with them. Like if you're Taylor Swift, if you're Beyonce, your money that second contract must be throughout the roof. Like where, like you said, it's a uh, perpetuity. <laughs> what is it? Th throughout the world and perpetuity. Some shit like that, right? In perpetuity, yeah. In perpetuity. You know what I mean? Throughout the world in perpetuity. Mm -hmm. Like, yo, that money must be like crazy. It has to be. But the contract said otherwise. Like they was giving them like 1.5 million to do an album. I mean, granted, in the grand scheme of things and, and, you know, as compared to other artists, it was at the top, but that's not crazy money. I mean, I think when you're a top level artist, they banking on it because they know that, yo, like, 
then none of that stuff is going to concern them because it must be some salesman merch type of deals, some stuff like, you know, just little nooks and crannies in the, in the, in the contract that secures them the money if they hit a certain number and they're going to hit those numbers. Mm-hmm. Like I'm pretty sure Kanye like, oh, we're, I got to make sure we sell like what? We, oh, I got I to gotta at least get the double platinum on this? Ha ha. No problem. Right, right. Hold my beer. Yeah, I that, got this. That was easy for me. That, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. Now, now, what if you chingy? Hey. That signed to Ludacris on DT, DTP, and then I think, like, I forgot, I forgot what the other, um, the one that's, like, doing the distribution yeah, for DTP. Chingy, chingy did go, like, triple. Come on. Black man. A black man. What about the second album? Oh, yeah, nah. That's what I'm trying to say to you. So, chingy, chingy's different, right? So, chingy does, like, triple platinum first album, mm-hmm. and then it's time to come again. They, like, oh, we going to give you whatever the f*** you want. And then he flops. That's what I'm trying to say. That's not Kanye West doesn't do that. But that's what I'm trying to say. So they, so, like, bro, it's just like a running back in the NFL. Like, what, like, what happened with Ezekiel Elliott? The second year, he like, oh, no, nah, I'm about to hold out. They're like, what? You're in the second year contract? He like, man, I'm the best running back in the league. Right. You're going to pay me. And what they do, they pay them. Right. Sometimes. So my thing is, we talking about beginning stages of Kanye West, right? Mm-hmm. This dude probably wasn't making a million dollars under Rockefeller yet, but he was making great money. Right. He making some, I'm really not starving for nothing type money. Right. And then all of a sudden, they let, let's just say the industry gave you 1.5 off that. I, you're like, oh, okay, okay, <laughs> okay. You never have seen 1.5 mil all in one sitting. Now, I'm not saying that should make you want to, like, you know, sign the papers. I'm just saying you do that, and then you wind up going, like, what, four or five mil off the <coughs> four, four or five million sales off the college dropout? Right. And then all of a sudden, you do another, like, three, four or five mil off the late registration? They probably was like, yo, what the f-? And then he like, oh, you know what? I'm about to go do my own thing. They're like, no, 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 Kanye, Kanye, listen, listen, we got $50 million for you ready right now. We just we just try to figure everything out. But they buy in, they buy in your next seven hours. Hey, yo, what the f- the is fifty million dollars right that he never seen before. Yeah. Who is the NAACP president? Michael Jordan or Brown Brown? I can't go to a barbershop in America or have a conversation with my younger brother uh, without discussing, you know, who has the better legacy, LeBron James or Michael Jordan. You know, so now they they talk about who was the better basketball player, who had the better stats, who has the better career. Uh, and depending on whatever generation you're from, you either going to say LeBron or, or Jordan. So now here we are in, in 2020 when, you know, activism is at an all-time high. Who is being more woke? So Michael Jordan recently purchased uh, NASCAR, a team and has Bubba Wallace, uh, like the, the lone black NASCAR driver, uh, working, you know, as his, his, his primary driver. Um, Jordan has also been like, you know, opening up medical clinics. He's been donating money to Black Lives Matter. He's been doing a lot of things. And we all know LeBron James's, uh, legacy and, and as far as activism goes where he's opening up schools he's been very vocal about black lives matter and you know all things pertaining to black people as as well as getting the the league behind supporting blackness so who do you think is more woke out of the two well i would say this I- if you want to just go face value, it's not more of who's more woke, I hate that word, who's more aware, whatever the case may be. If one is older than the other and one was able to get, you know, it was, is one is able to live off the legacy before the other. So let me say that again. One is older than the other. And on top of that, the older one has been able to live off their legacy compared to the other. LeBron is still in the league. Mm -hmm. 
And while LeBron has the Nike deal while he's in the league, he has the I Promise school while he's in the league. And he has clutch sports, while, you know, his own uh, agency, sport, sporting agency while he's in the league. I mean, it's fair to say that during Jordan's tenure, he had Nike, he, he had Haynes, he has Haynes, he still has Haynes, he still has Nike, and sort of. And uh, I don't know, I guess he had the Chicago White Sox for a little while too. Now, let's fast forward. While LeBron has all of these, uh, he, he has all of these accolades going on. He has, he's putting all these accomplishments under his belt. Michael Jordan owns the Charlotte Hornets. He's the CEO of that team. He has the money where he can give out $30 million in the course of 10 years. So 30 each year, but 10 years to black American organizations. He has the money to be a NASCAR team owner. And yes, in its height of activism, it's great to see our, you know, one of our black celebrities put their money where their mouth is. Mm-hmm. So for me, I don't care who's more work, woke, whether it's Jordan or LeBron, I'm happy to see two brothers take the place of, take the mantle of what Martin and Malcolm put together right. and, and, and take it to new heights. Because this isn't, this isn't that W.E.B. Du Bois Booker T. Washington conversation. This isn't a first class black, black citizen versus a second class black citizen. No, this is Martin and Malcolm. These are two people that have differences only because they want to be regarded as the best in their sport. And that's what competition, that's what sportsmanship is all about. It's, a, it's, it's about that competitiveness. And I don't think they're being competitive about who's more black. I think it's them to realizing, especially, I, I think if anything, you got to give LeBron a lot of credit because I think what LeBron has put together during his tenure as a basketball player as far as to, to social justice has made Michael Jordan wake up and say, you know what? Well, let me help out, young man, you know, because I see what you're going with. Wells Fargo thinks that black Americans do not want a career in their banking industry. Hanif, what say you? When I was a kid, when I was about 13, 14 years old, I I went to Urban League and Uh Urban League, you know, groomed me to, to, to be in a professional career. Yeah, they did. I mean, but come on, let's be honest. They didn't do a great job of that. It was All good. right, but, but hear me out. So okay. Urban League had me go work for Broad National Bank, you know what I'm saying, to, 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 to further the skills that they taught me. So How old I, were you again? I was about 13 or 14 years old. Okay, I just want to make sure. Keep going, keep going. All right, yes, so yes. when I go to Broad National Bank, right, yes. all, they, all they essentially had me doing as a kid was data entry. Mm-hmm. But it's a skill. Yes. You know what I'm saying? So mm-hmm. if I'm learning data entry at 13 to 14 years old and I get great at data entry. Yes. You know what I'm saying? And then I, you know, as I grow up and I become available, I can master any data entry job that's available. And to be honest with you, I'm going to keep it a whole buck. Corporate America is essentially a bunch of data entry jobs anyway. Uh-huh. You know what I'm that's saying? True. That's true. So... So these are skills that are being honed. When you, when you actually are looking to recruit, you can say to me like, yo, this person is good at math. I can find a place for him in my organization where those skills are going to be useful. And then I can groom them in order to be successful in that situation. But for you to go out and say, hey, listen, the kids, because because I'm gonna tell you what's actually happening. All of us, we're we're getting out of high school, we're getting accepted into college, and we're f- going to get communications degrees. You know what I'm saying? Because we feel like, oh, entertainment is the the way. This is what we've always been successful at. But if I graduate from high school and based on my grades and my skills that I performed in high school, my natural abilities, I have Bank of America or Wells Fargo come in and say, listen, natural ability, this guy. 
What Listen, do you mean, honey? No, honey, watch yourself. What do you mean natural abilities? What if somebody's natural abilities is to entertain in some type of way? What are you then, talking about? Then that's what they that, do. But if but somebody, not, yo, if somebody has a natural inclination mm-hmm. towards math or writing or science or, you know what I mean? It's just what they gravitate But that's what career is. placement in college is there for. No, the no, point, no. But, what's Listen up? to what I'm saying first. Okay. What I'm saying to you is that if Wells Fargo comes to college to freshman orientation and say, listen, if you follow this career path based on your skills, and this is what we feel like you'd be good at, if you follow these metrics, when you graduate, we have a job for you. Yeah, they don't do that. They need to do that. They should be doing that. So don't tell me that talent is not available when you're not actually seeking talent. You're, you, you want people to go out and focus like these careers. These are careers that we've been, been you know, blackballed or redlined from for centuries. Don't tell me that there's not talent because black people aren't seeking. Because When they going. say it's not talent, I'm pretty sure what they're saying is people are not lining up to want to be in that industry. That's all I'm saying. I, I agree with you. Well, all I'm saying is that they can tell the media that, oh, you know, if, if, they, if they ever had, yo, I see a lot of white Latinos in Wells Fargo, why is no blacks? They can easily just say, well, based on our data and research, a lot of black people, you know, just, we just you know, we're looking for them, but they don't want to show up. And I'm just saying that their argument can easily be that no one is showing up. But I agree, I agree with you that we're here. Yeah, so what, what came first, chicken and egg? Like, yo, are you recruiting people for real? Or are you just saying that nobody came to your table when you, when you showed up at hey, career yo, day? The f- this yeah, is the second. F- right here. Should hip hop really cancel DJ Vlad? Hip hop should cancel DJ Vlad. So we all know that, you know, DJ Vlad has this running the thing around him where he's kind of like the feds where basically people who he interviewed with, he gets them to say some of the most incriminating things that's possible. Now, granted them saying those incriminating things is on them, but for whatever reason they go on to his show and they end up with some sort of indictment shortly after. Um, recent headlines is DJ Vlad has misquoted uh, the Honorable uh, Minister Louis Farrakhan in oh, stating man. that Farrakhan made some inflammatory remarks, remarks against Jewish people. Um, and he, he positioned it in a way where it was saying that Farrakhan was telling Muslims to take up arms against Jews because he quoted some something in the Bible about them picking up stones when they recognize the Jews. Um, when Farrakhan was actually saying that, you know, he had a specific issue with two attorneys who were representing Donald Trump, who just so happened to be Jewish. And he was explaining like they needed to be exposed with the truth and the stones represented the truth. So when DJ Vlad's colleagues, um, Lord Jamar, Godfrey, my son, Royce the Five Nine, confronted him to say, listen, you need to clarify that because those anti-Semitic remarks are, you know, derogatory towards him. Uh, DJ Vlad decided, like, you know, I'm, I'm not going to make an apology for it. Um, he mentioned that he was going to clarify it, but he never really did. And then when they came down to it, they was like, yo, if, if you know, Viacom, uh, YouTube, or whoever's paying your bills would have asked you to, to apologize, you would have apologized. But when the people who you're actually marketing to, black people, the yeah. people who actually come on your show to contribute to you, ask you to apologize because we're offended, you're going to take the stance that you don't because it's not really going to affect your bottom line, then we're going to boycott you. And we're going to see how that affects your bottom line. So we want to know if hip hop really has the power to get DJ Vlad the fuck up out of here. Not only does hip hop has the power, we all as people have the power. 
that's the problem with a lot of this stuff. Even with, you know, not to, uh, you know, shift to another thing real fast, real fast, but even with the election that's about to come up very, very shortly, you know, you don't have to vote or you can vote, even though we're all expected to vote. But when you don't vote, you're not voting to disrespect. You're voting because it's about something. Your vote is special, the same way a woman's body is, right? I mean, a woman's, you know what, is it's precious. It's a jewel. It's, this is priceless. Your vote is priceless. So if you feel like this man who is who's basically saying, all right, my stance regarding my religion and my beliefs and who I am as a, uh, not only as a nation of people, but as a belief of people, this is so important. It's more important than you. It's more important than the pictures I have with Russell Simmons or Godfrey, any of that. At the end of the day, it's good to be a Jew, not to be anything else other than that. And that's what this person just made a stance on. And, you know, it is what it is with that. I mean, it's probably the people that looks like him in his delegation, let him know the stance that you need to take. And you know what? For, for all you know, that might help him out in the long run. Because what if hip hop does cancel DJ Vlad? Does that mean DJ Vlad won't get a job ever again? Not really. I mean, he's a Jewish American brother. I mean, I'm pretty sure he can go to Viacom and they may be a drink, a drunk champs, sh- uh, Shalom style, ASAP. <laughs> you know? What's wrong with that? Jews, you're not mad at me because I said Shalom style, right? I didn't say nothing rude. I mean, I, I basically gave you points. I'm basically saying that you run in the industry and this brother who the hip hop community feels as though they're not treat, they're not being represented right by, by DJ Vlad. That doesn't mean that much because you guys can hire him to do, you know, a ra- you know, his own radio show. And he can go interview other people. All he's interviewing right now is the hip hop community and porn stars. So he can go incriminate Tom Hanks and Brad Pitt next month. Easy, no problem. He'll get even more views for doing that. Hey yo, what the f this is a pallet right here.